we've been looking forward to this ministry. We've been looking forward to uh, having him here with us. Uh, I first heard him in Duluth uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, Pastor Matt heard him several, well, ran into him at a conference, at the conference, at the Grace Conference a few years ago. And uh, it's just, I, every opportunity I get to watch him on YouTube and, uh, uh, I, you know, I like to yell at the TV and I just, I, I, yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that, that when you watch him, I, I always like to say, you preach it and I'll turn the pages. I just really enjoy him and have had uh, uh, a real blessing from watching him, from reading his books, from reading the blogs he posts on his website, not by works. Uh, I'll let him say more about the ministry uh, when he when he gets opportunity here, when he wants to take the opportunity. So Dr. Hickson, come and minister to us today. Thank you. You know, there was a time when the term gospel, even among unchurched people, sort of culturally had the nuance of certainty. So people would say things like, um, it's the gospel truth. You ever heard that saying? Now, they may not know the gospel if it came up and bit them on the rear end, but they would say that phrase as a way to validate that what they're saying really is true. It's the gospel truth. But these days, uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. And speaking of truth, uh, let's talk about the irrelevancy of truth in our current culture. Only 28% of Americans today believe there are, is absolute truth. And I always try to verify this whenever I use this statistic. And so I did that in preparation for this message. And there are four or five different scientific polls that validate this statistic coming at it from a number of different angles. If you break it down, according to one study, uh, 57% of American adults believe that what is right or wrong is a matter of personal experience. So personal experience trumps uh, the Bible in this case. Um, among millennials... 74% would strongly agree with the statement, whatever is right for your life or works best for you is the only truth you can know. So 28% believe there's uh, absolute truth. What about this? 51% of Americans believe that two contradictory statements can be true at the same time. And the other 51% believe... No, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> Among teenagers, 9% of those who consider themselves to be born-again Christians, now let's just say for the sake of argument that those who check that box understand what it means to be born again, that by faith alone they've trusted in Jesus Christ who died and rose again for their sins as the only one who can give them the free gift of eternal life. But for whatever, whatever the reality of it is, these are people that self-identify as being born-again Christians. That, that speaks something. And of those, 1 in 10... One in ten say they believe in moral absolutes. Now, that's pretty scary. Eighty-three uh, percent of American Protestants believe that many religions can lead to eternal life. Now, that statistic doesn't surprise me particularly when you understand the, the state of American Protestant denominations, right? Most mainline denominations long ago abandoned the authority of God's Word and, and, and absolute truth. So 83 percent, if anything, to me sounded a little bit low. Uh, but I'm going to give you a statistic in a moment that really did uh, frighten me to the core. But that's the irrelevancy of the truth. Now, if we talk about the Bible, the irrelevancy of the Bible, 21% of Americans believe that the Bible is, quote, an ancient book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts made up by man. 21%. The survey, this particular survey was conducted by Gallup in 2014. 50% think that the Bible, the Koran, and the Book of Mormon all teach the same spiritual truths. 50%. And only 4% of Christians claim to have a biblical worldview. I won't take the time to explain how in this particular survey they got to that, drilled down to that level, but it was pretty airtight. 4%. Um, in other words, 96% of Christians, self-proclaimed Christians, would say that the Bible trumps everything else when making decisions. You know, 96% would say that. Only 4% say, no, the Bible is the only standard for my beliefs, attitudes, and practices. And that's what we believe. We believe that God's Word uh, 
is the only standard for our beliefs, attitudes, and practices. And what that means is when the Bible, uh, when our beliefs, something has taken over my computer here. We'll blame it on the Packers fans. Um, So what that means is that when my beliefs, attitudes, and practices differ from what's in this book, I have to change, all right? And what, we, what has happened is we live in a culture that tries to change what God's Word means, twist it to suit their own needs. Uh, it's creating God in the image of man. But if that's our culture's view of the Bible, just imagine its view of the gospel. And this is the statistic that uh, really blew me away. Uh, 60% of evangelical church attenders. Now, that's a pretty specific subset of people. First of all, in general, evangelical means you believe in the Trinity, inerrancy, and a born-again experience, an individual born-again experience to be saved. Um, and church attenders means you're not just identifying with that group, but you're actually living it. You're in a pew just like this somewhere every you know, Sunday. And 60% of them say many religions can lead to eternal life. So this is why the gospel matters, because it's under attack. It has been... Uh, since you know time began in the Garden of Eden when Satan uh, tempted uh, Adam and Eve, and there's my visual aid for that moment in human history right there, um, the forbidden fruit. Sorry about that. I usually have that covered, but my screen broke, so I've got a replacement. But I was mentioning to somebody, uh, you know, Adam and Eve chose the apple, and look what it did to the rest of us. So they were they were Mac fans, but that's uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. They were also the first human beings to not read the apple terms and conditions, and did not end well. But um, it, the gospel has been under attack since, since Satan was kicked out of heaven. And in particular, in the first century after Calvary, from a linear perspective, Paul tells us that you know, Satan is blinding men's hearts to the gospel in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So let's take a look at just a, a few scriptures before we get into Galatians chapter 1 as we answer this question, does the gospel matter? Uh, For example, we could look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, where we understand that the consequences for not believing or obeying, as it's talked about here, the gospel, are clearly everlasting. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, when he shall come to be glorified in in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. So, Does the gospel matter? Well, Paul seems to think it does here. He told the Thessalonians, those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord, obey there's a metonym for believe, we punish with everlasting destruction. Uh, What about Ephesians chapter 1? In whom you also trusted, talking about Christ, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So get the picture. You hear the word of truth, which is the gospel specifically in this context. You believed in it. And having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, a promise. So the gospel seems to have some identifiable, quantifiable content that must be believed. Not just any old gospel will do, but what is the gospel? So a big part of our ministry and and a big passion of mine is the clarity, accuracy, and urgency of the gospel message. So I always like to ask it this way. Is it possible to know what one must believe in order to have eternal life. Is that information knowable? The answer has to be yes, because if the answer was no to that first question, then nobody could ever be saved. If it were not possible to know what you have to believe to be saved, no one could ever be saved. Agree? So if the answer is yes, and it is, then the next natural question that follows is, what is it? Is it possible to know what you have to believe to be saved? Yes. Well, then what is it? What do you have to know to be saved? And the Bible spells that out. And we live in a culture, we'll talk more about this tonight, that is much more comfortable with ambiguity, with a lack of certainty, with wiggle room. They don't like pinpointing anything. And yet Proverbs tells us we can know the certainty of the word of truth. And certainly that is true when it comes to the gospel. I love 1 Corinthians 1, where Paul makes it very clear uh, when he makes these references to preaching the cross. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, that is, human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Now, where have we heard that phrase before? You might call to mind Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God 
to all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So uh, Paul says we preach the gospel those uh, because it's the power of God. He goes on to say, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Notice th there has to be something preached before people can believe it and be saved. And that preaching is the gospel. So again, you have Romans ten seventeen lived out in, in these epistolary passages like Corinthians and Thessalonians. Uh, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So you've got to hear something to believe it. So, you know, we're going to uh, touch in a moment on some of the false gospels that are so prevalent today. But most people, uh, as long as Jesus is somewhere remotely in the mix of the discussion, that's the gospel. And frankly, it's not even altogether certain that Jesus has to be in the mix these days. Um, but the gospel is much more precise than that. It's not uh, kaleidoscopic, it's microscopic, right? You know what a kaleidoscope is? It's, you know, you turn it and it's got this chips of glass and colors and it has this endless variety of colors. That's the way most people view the gospel today or getting to heaven, being saved from the penalty of sin, you know, rescued from eternal torment and hell. That's the way most people view the gospel, but it's not. It's, it's more precise than that. It has an identifiable content. Uh, at the Jerusalem Council, Peter rose up and said unto the men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. You hear something, you believe it. When faith meets the gospel, the result is eternal life every time. And that's the only way eternal life results. People can and do believe many things in life that won't get them to heaven. I believed and hoped that the Patriots would lose yesterday, <laughs> and that didn't happen. Fortunately, my eternal destiny is not dependent upon uh, the Patriots, um, because somehow they find a way to cheat and win every year. Um, but uh, we see this again in, in Galatians 2. This is interesting. This is, you know, early on in Paul's ministry, he confronts the well-established key disciple who helped start the first church in Jerusalem there in Acts 2, one of the inner three disciples, and he confronts them. And he says to Peter, he confronted them according to the truth of the gospel, because they were not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. And so I said to Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Uh, notice the truth of the gospel. And not every gospel is the gospel. All right. uh, and then we could go to Acts 11. This is Peter recounting his interaction with uh, Cornelius in chapter 10. And uh, Peter says, And he uh, shewed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said to him, Send men to Joppa, call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, I love that, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Uh, there's a famous... Uh, uh, statement from uh, St. Francis of Assisi that you often see on bumper stickers and posters, and whenever I see it, I want to rip it off the wall. In fact, truth be known, I've done that a few times when nobody was looking. But it's, it, it's one of those that sounds good, but a discerning believer will recognize it's really not right. It's not accurate. And that is the statement, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. As if you can preach the gospel by shoveling someone's driveway or raking their leaves or carrying their groceries in from the car or helping them across the street. Now, don't misunderstand. Those are all part of the equation. We want to gain an entree for the gospel by being loving and Christ-like with our neighbors and friends. We want to shovel people's walks, and we should. We want to rake their leaves, and we should. But, but don't confuse that for preaching the gospel. Because the gospel hasn't been preached unless you use words. And those words are not just any words, but words that, that, that articulate precisely what the gospel is according to the standard of God's word. Colossians 1.5, we see the word of the truth of the gospel. First Thess 1, Paul says, the gospel came not unto you in word only. He's talking there about the, the power and the signs and wonders of, of the first century apostolic age, but the point is it came in word. It came in word. 1 Peter 1, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, being born again by the word of God. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So again, 
you have to preach words. You pre that's what you do. You preach words. I'm up here preaching, teaching, using words. And the gospel must contain words, and those words have a particular content. And then we could go to the uh, the granddaddy of all the passages that articulate the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. My brother, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. And what is it? Well, Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, was buried and rose from the dead according to the Scripture. So, does the gospel matter? I hope you're beginning to see that at least uh, the testimony of God's Word seems to think the gospel matters. And those, I, I took the time to go through those verses because we, I think we live in an age that makes it easy to forget that the gospel has a quantifiable content. So Galatians chapter 1, let's look at verses 6 and 7 to start with. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Let me set the stage. I know you're well versed in this passage, but this was Paul's first letter written chronologically anyway, if you look at him in history. He had been saved in 35 A.D. on the road to Damascus, spent 14 years studying, and, and then began his first missionary journey in late 48 A.D. from Antioch. And he visited uh, with Barnabas the region of southern Galatia where they preached the gospel. And uh, the Holy Spirit gave him a great harvest of souls. People were believing the gospel. They were being saved. He came back to give his report to the home church in Antioch. No sooner did he get back than he heard reports. I guess he got an email or maybe it was a text or something or he saw a Twitter post. But he learned that there had been people that had come in after they had left that region and began undermining the message of the gospel and undermining Paul's authority. And, uh, you know, I imagine it when something like this. They, you know, people that attack the gospel are usually pretty... Um, intelligent in how they do it. You know, deception is, is, a, is, is a fine art. And so they would, they would come in and they would, knowing that Paul was sort of the hero that just left and everybody loved him, they would say, man, wasn't that Paul great? He was awesome. Didn't you love what he had to say about this? And this man, it was great. But man, as great as he was, let me tell you, there's one other little thing you might want to consider to really get to heaven. You have to be circumcised and keep the Jewish law. But other than that, Paul was great. I don't know if that's how it went or not, but however they did it, they managed to really confuse these new baby Christians, as to the content of the gospel and what it really took uh, to be saved. So Paul, who was going to be leaving from Antioch, heading to Jerusalem to have this early meeting of the apostles to sort of deal with this issue of Jew and Gentile, and what does this look like? It was a kind of a messy time politically. Uh, this was, of course, still during the revelatory age of the first century, and uh, the scripture was still being revealed uh, by the Holy Spirit. So, but before, I believe actually, most likely on his way from Antioch to Jerusalem, Paul penned the words of Galatians. He didn't even wait for the, the, the ruling of the Jerusalem council. He was so burdened by what was going on in southern Galatia that he wanted to write this letter. Uh, and, and, and so he, he jumps right in. I find it noteworthy that the very first thing Paul wrote under the inspiration of Scripture, uh, Paul, who... Uh, was the second most prolific writer of Scripture in the New Testament. Who wrote most of the New Testament, by the way? It's a little pop quiz. I know you know. Luke. Luke. So Luke and Acts together comprise more than Paul's 13 epistles. Now, if Paul wrote Hebrews, as Jesus and I believe that he did, <laughs> uh, then that 14th book would put Paul over the top, and he would become the most prolific writer. But officially... Until we get to heaven and I'll find out I'm right, um, we can say that Luke wrote more than Paul. But it's noteworthy that in, in, uh, of Paul, who wrote 13 books of the New Testament, the first thing he addresses under the inspiration of the Spirit is the clarity of the gospel. The clarity of the gospel. So notice what he says there. Um, you know, you're, you're removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. Okay. Now, of course, we know the Bible was not written originally in English, and sometimes it's helpful to do a little bit of a word study. So that's what we're going to do to find out what does he mean. Is it another gospel or is it not another gospel, right? So I want to point out three things from this text in our remaining time. The first thing I want us to know is that the biblical gospel is precise. That's what we've been saying. All of those passages we read allude to that and imply that, and some outright say it, the truth of the gospel. But here it, it becomes very clear the biblical gospel is precise. In verse 6, uh, he says, you're departing unto another 
gospel. That's the word heteros in Greek. It means another of a different kind. Heteros, right? But then in verse 7, he says it's actually not another, but that's a different Greek word. It's the word alos, which means another of the same kind. What is Paul saying here? Well, uh, when he says that you've turned to uh, you know, a heteros gospel and not an alas gospel, what he's saying is this isn't a gospel that is somewhat close to the original or to the actual gospel. He's saying it's nothing like it. So let me illustrate it this way. If I were to run to the grocery store and Wendy were to say, I would like you to get some apples, and she were to say, now be sure you get red delicious apples, right? Well, being a guy, what I am, I'm a hunter, and so I I, I said, I'd be glad to do that for you, honey, because I love you so much, and there's nothing that I would not do for you, all right? So I hop in the car, I set my time, my stopwatch, because I'm going to try to beat my record from the last time I ran to the grocery store to get groceries, and uh, I rush off the grocery store, I run into the grocery store, I find the first tub, fortunately for me, the produce section is almost always right near the door at grocery stores, I find the first tub of things that look red. I grab a dozen of them, and I throw them in a bag. I check out, and I come home, and I say, here you are. And I have a bag of Braeburn apples. Now, what's she going to say? Thank you, honey, but those are not red delicious apples. Now, what am I going to say? An apple's an apple. What's what's the problem, right? Uh, In reality, what Paul is saying is what you have turned to is not an alas gospel, a similar close enough gospel, but it's a heteros gospel. So it'd be as if I went after a bag of apples and came back with a bag of oranges, right? Um, which is where we get the phrase apples and oranges, right? But the reality is even that's not strong enough to indicate the meaning of this word heteros, because you could argue, well, an orange, at least it's a fruit, right? So it's in the same classification, maybe. So what if I came home with a bag of like kazoos or something? <laughs> Now you could say that's heteros, that's absolutely no, or kittens, let's say, uh, that's no connection to apples at all. Isn't that kitten cute? I love cats, they taste like chicken. Um, <laughs> but in the context of the gospel, it's actually, it's actually worse than that. It's as if I was at, running after apples and I came back with a bag of poison. Because, you see, the gospel is a matter of life and death. It's the only hope for a lost and dying world. We're all under the penalty of sin, and that penalty is of eternal consequences. And the only hope is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And when we put our faith in Him, the only one who took my place and your place at Calvary, died and rose again, defeating death, hell, and the grave, then and only then can we have eternal life. So it might be fine to have an alas bag of apples, but it's by no means good to have a heteros gospel. The gospel is precise. It means something, but it's also perfect. If you go on at the end of verse 7, he goes on to say, there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That word pervert is, is interesting. It comes from the Greek word metastrepho, metastrepho. In its various forms, it's only used three times in the New Testament. Now, we want to be careful not to transfer meaning from one of the uses into another, but it is somewhat instructive to see how it's used in the other two times it comes up in the New Testament. If you were to look it up in a lexicon, it would have the idea of to distort or to twist, which is precisely what the Judaizers were doing in southern Galatia after Paul left. They were twisting and distorting, adding to the gospel. But let's uh, let's see what metastrepho means in these or how it's used in these other two cases. It's used in Acts chapter 2 when Peter is quoting from Joel 2, and he says uh, in his sermon, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. That word turned, same word, metastrepho. And then it's used by James, the Lord's brother, in James 4 when he says, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Now what do you notice about those two occurrences of the word metastrepho? They're 180s, aren't they? You've got light to darkness. You've got joy to mourning. That's exactly what Paul was saying the Judaizers were were doing with grace. They were perverting it. They were turning it 180 degrees on its head. Even the slightest addition or subtraction to the gospel turns it on its head. It's not that Jesus died and rose again again 
to pay 99% of our sin debt, and we bring a little bit to the table, or 98 or 99.5. He paid it all. Jesus paid it all. It's nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. And that's why Paul goes on to say in verse, verses 8 and 9, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Anathema is the Greek word there. Come under strict judgment. Uh, as we've said before, then he repeats it for emphasis. So I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The gospel is perfect just as it is. It doesn't need any alteration or improvement or tweaking or correcting or modifying. Now, you can, you can communicate the gospel and should communicate the gospel with a cultural sensitivity. If I'm going to give the gospel in Bryansk, Russia, which I've done, uh, I might introduce it and illustrate it and so forth in different ways. And at the very minimum, I'm going to use a different language because they don't speak English. But And if I'm going to preach it in California versus Midwest or here, I may set the stage, open the door. But when it gets down to the core essence of the gospel, it never changes. And uh, as you may have heard me say before, you can state the gospel in 10 words or less. Christ died for my sins and rose from the dead. If that's not part of the gospel, the gospel hasn't been preached. If there's no Jesus, no death, no resurrection, no sin, no faith, no eternality, the gospel hasn't been preached. The gospel isn't God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, and if you'll just come to Jesus, He'll make all things better. You'll be happier. You'll be less depressed. You'll have your best life now. That's not the gospel. Uh, It's certainly true that those who know the Lord are going to have a better perspective here and now, but Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we would be happier here and now. He died on the cross to rescue us from the penalty of sin, which is eternal life in a literal place of torment called hell. So the gospel is perfect, and these Judaizers were perverting it. They were turning it 180 degrees on its head. And then finally, verse 10 shows us the biblical gospel is paramount. He he concludes almost in a rhetorical afterthought as if he's anticipating the objections. Remember, he's fairly new on the scene at this point. You know, he has not established his authority and reputation as a, a powerful apostle. And he says, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. In other words, you know, I I know some of you might not like what I'm saying because you thought those Judaizers were good people, but they're so nice. They're so good, you know. Um, but I'm not really trying to win friends at this moment. I'm not trying to make enemies. We need to remember that too. You know, I preached a message not too long ago on uh, defending grace graciously because sometimes some of the most ungracious people I've ever met are people in my camp, including myself at times, that are defending grace, and we do it very bitterly. So we're not trying to make enemies, but we're not trying to win friends. We're trying to defend the gospel. And that's what Paul says. I'm trying to please God. Let the chips fall where they may. And um, that's my that's my one and only goal. What matters most is the gospel. We live in a day and age when that's not the case. The gospel has re- been relegated to a sort of a subsidiary component of the bigger Christian picture and Christianity picture. In fact, <clears throat> I've had People, when I was defending the gospel, I had an elder at a church one time look at me and say, you care too much about the gospel. Not everybody cares about it as much as you. Back off, you know. I had someone I was uh, very close to look at me one time when I pointed out that their pastor of a very large mega church, you would know him if I mentioned his name, but that he had, I had been there personally and witnessed this firsthand. He had encouraged people, more than 10,000 people gathered uh, in this setting uh, to if they were there and they uh, were Muslim and didn't believe in the God of Christianity, he was going to pray to God, but he didn't want to offend them. So he said, if you, don't, if you don't like our God while I'm praying to God, feel free to go ahead and pray to Allah from his pulpit, encouraging people to pray to Allah. When I told this person that, who was a member of that church and was not there on that occasion, uh, they looked at me, kind of cocked their head and said, but they have such a nice nursery, which was all that mattered for them at that moment in their young kids. The gospel is what matters most. So 
I'll close with this. Um, I'm just going to list them for you. I go into great detail about all of these in the book, Getting the Gospel Wrong, uh, which is in the resource room uh, across from the uh, uh, auditorium here. Uh, but uh, there are, in my estimation, at least six, and we could, you may come up with several on your own too. We could have listed many more, but that seem to be very prevalent in our postmodern culture. The first is nothing new by any means, and that's the performance gospel. This has been around for since time began. People have always tried to earn their way back into right favor with God. Um, and that's the theme of our ministry, not by works, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we have, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saves us. And so the performance gospel is any type of gospel that tries to make man's behavior a requisite, whether it's a prerequisite or a postrequisite, but somehow you got to have good works. you got to have them to get saved, or you got to have them on the back end and you're not, or you're not saved. But either way, it makes performance somehow a part of the salvific content. And then you've got uh, the purpose gospel. <clears throat> and this, again, is very prevalent. And I'm not just referring to the Rick Warren uh, component of this. I'm, I'm, you know, there are a lot of people that may not even know the name Rick Warren, but they think that somehow the gospel is about finding your true north or finding your purpose, your meaning in life, just somehow you know, being steady and, and, and they don't understand that it's about eternity and it's about sin and it's about... So, so again, as I mentioned earlier, this gospel would, be, would, you know, would, would sound something like this. Um, are you feeling lonely and discouraged and depressed? Does your life lack meaning and direction? Would you like to find true purpose in life? Come to Jesus and He'll give it to you. Now, is it true that a relationship with Christ gives us purpose and meaning? Absolutely. But that's not the gospel. That's a part of the sanctification process. And when we're walking with the Lord, because we've by faith trusted in Him and Him alone is the only one who can save us, then yeah, we're going to have a better outlook on life. Paul says, set your mind on things above. You know, remember your citizenship is in heaven, right? Jesus said, I come that you may have life and that more abundantly. So it's not that this uh, concept of, of the quality of life now is, is so wrong. It's just when that's the sum total of the gospel, then it's a matter of life and death, and you're not preaching the gospel. Um, you know, eternal life, as you know, begins not when you die. It begins when you believe the gospel. And eternal life is a present commodity. The first so many years of it occur on this old earth, bound by time, space, and matter, sold under sin. Uh, and we can have eternal life now if we've trusted Christ. Uh, we don't have to wait till we die to wonder, do I have it? I have it now. Uh, and so there is a sense in which our eternal life impacts very much so our physical life on earth. In my case, I was saved at age six, so if the Lord tarries is coming, I may have 80 years to live out my life in this, you know, in this uh, current present world. And then I have all of eternity uh, you know, to, to live it out uh, with Christ face to face. Uh, so it does matter now, but it's not the only thing that matters. And then we've got the puzzling gospel. And this one by this one, I give several examples in the book of people who may not be intending to preach a false gospel. Not that anybody's intending to preach a false gospel, but I mean, they actually really mean well. They're trying to be clear. They're trying to preach the saving message, but they're using you know, colloquialisms and cultural terms and phrases that aren't found in Scripture, and the end result, unwittingly, is that it becomes puzzling. It becomes puzzling and unclear, and so that's why we're passionate about the accuracy and clarity and urgency of the gospel message. And then there's the prosperity gospel. Um, we don't need to say too much about this, but this is sort of marrying the concepts of sin and the penalty for sin and eternal life with uh, monetary prosperity and health, wealth, those kinds of things. If, they're, if you're poor, it's because you haven't you know, got, been saved. If you're sick, it's because you haven't been saved or you have a lack of faith, and it just muddies the whole water there. And I give several examples in the book of that. And then, the, in general, the pluralistic gospel is becoming a, a very a formidable foe today. People who say, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine that if you believe you know, the death and resurrection of Christ is what saves you from sin, that's good for you. But over here, these sincere, devout Muslims who don't believe that but believe something else, as long as their faith is sincere, uh, you know, that's okay. Uh, that'll get them there. And who are we to say that their faith is wrong? Uh, so it's, it's this... It's evangelical inclusivism, but it's even broader than that. It's pluralism, and we'll talk more about that.
uh, in the, one of those sessions later this week. And then finally, the promise-only gospel is folks who on the surface may sound like they agree with us because they're passionate against works, which we applaud. They don't want to bring works into the gospel. But in an effort to strip the gospel of any hint of good works or behavior being necessary to get to heaven, they have stripped it of its core components. And these are the ones that say, you don't have to know Jesus died. You don't have to know He rose again. You don't have to know you're a sinner. You just <clears throat> have to believe the promise of a guy named Jesus who guarantees you eternal life. And if you believe His promise, you'll go to heaven. I actually asked someone one time who espouses and is a leading proponent of this view. So you're telling me a person could get saved today in the present age, die and go to heaven, meet Jesus for the first time face to face, and learn only then that He died and rose again for their sins. And they say, yeah, that's possible. You don't have to know you're a sinner. You don't have to know that He died. You don't have to know that He rose again. And I would refer you back to the other uh, passages we already looked at to make it clear that the gospel is the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So what is the gospel then? Well, let's talk about the pure gospel. Uh, Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. It doesn't get any simpler uh, than that. So uh, the gospel does matter, but it only matters if truth matters. And if there's a standard, a, a source that we can look to, to answer the question, what must someone believe precisely to be saved? The Bible makes that crystal clear. You know, if there's one thing the Bible is going to be clear about, and let's be honest, there's room for disagreement in a lot of areas. We, we want to be gracious. But if there's one thing the Bible is clear about, it's the gospel. It's so simple a child can understand it. That's the reason Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. So uh, we wanted to start by laying the foundation why this other stuff that we're going to be talking about in terms of epistemology, why do we know what we know, why do we believe what we believe is so critical, because it is a matter of life and death. So let's pray, then I would be glad to kind of uh, visit with you at our table out there and just uh, during the break between uh, Sunday school and worship. And uh, thank you guys for coming. I hope you'll come back uh, throughout the week. We've got a lot of good stuff we want to talk about, and uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we do thank you for our time together this morning, and thank you for this reminder about the importance of the gospel. And uh, thank you that you, you left us with a witness, your word, the living, written word of God that we can turn to, to find direction and to find answers. And thank you that this is not something ambiguous or hard to understand, but it's so clear. So Lord, I pray that you continue to uh, bless Grace Bible and help them to be a light on a hill as they continue to proclaim the clear, accurate, and urgent gospel message. Thank you for our time together. We do pray if there's one here by chance that doesn't know you, that came in by divine appointment and heard the gospel that your Holy Spirit would convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and that they would not leave this place today without in simple childlike faith, placing their trust in your Son and our Savior, who died and rose again for our sins as the only hope of eternal life. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen.